Next item of business is a statement by Hamza Yousaf on the Ferry Services Procurement Policy Review. The Minister will take questions at the end of his statement, and so there should be no interventions or interruptions. And I call on Hamza Yousaf uh, up to 10 minutes, please, Minister. Thank you, Presiding Officer. As Minister for Transport and Islands, I am, of course, responsible for the provision of safe, efficient and reliable ferry services to the island and remote rural communities which rely on them for economic, social and cultural sustainability. It's a responsibility that I and this government take extremely seriously. That is why in my statement to Parliament on the 2nd of February earlier this year, I announced a policy review on the future approach to the procurement of the Scottish Government's three contracted ferry services, namely the Clyde and Hebrides, the Northern Isles and the Guruk Dunoon Town Centre route. My announcement was informed by the Scottish Government's joint approach with the RMT Trade Union to the European Commission on the 1st of April 2016 in the Commission's response of the 22nd of September. That correspondence concerned the possibility of making a direct award to an in-house operator in compliance with full requirements of the TECL exemption in the state aid rules, potentially removing the need for competitive tendering procedures in the future. In my announcement on the 2nd of February, I said that should the review conclude it would be possible to apply the TECL exemption and meet stated rules, the Scottish Government would be minded to make a direct award to an in-house operator. This remains, presiding officer, our position, subject to, of course, wider financial and policy implications, but most crucially, the views of local communities and local stakeholders. On the 20th of July 2017 this year, I informed Parliament of the policy review's progress. I said that further consideration would be needed to, to be given to the application of the TECL exemption and the stated rules, following which a final decision can be taken on whether it would be possible to make a direct award to an in-house operator at some point in the future. I made clear that this would require an extension to the plan timeline for the completion of the policy review, but that I would publish an interim report setting out the emerging findings and implications for each of the three ferry services. I have today published that report, copies of which are available, available in SPICE and also from Transport Scotland's website. The report confirms that a direct award to a TECL compliant in-house operator under the procurement regime would be compatible with the maritime cabotage regulation, subject to further consideration of how we will in practice satisfy the TECL control test. The control test requires Scottish governments to exert similar levels of control over an in-house operator to that which we exert over one of our own government departments. The immediate consideration will therefore focus on changes to governance arrangements for David McBrain Group of Companies, something that we believe to be achievable and which can be completed with very little or indeed no impact on employees. The report also confirms the need to satisfy state aid rules. The state aid rules pursue uh, different aims from the procurement regime, although the two, of course, are related. State aid rules flow directly from Article 107 of the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union and state that any aid granted by a member state which threatens to distort competition is incompatible, incompatible with the internal market. It is therefore necessary to consider those rules when assessing the possibility of making a direct award to an in-house company, even if the in-house company is TECO compliant. This is very clear from the Commission's response on the 22nd of September. In our assessment of the stated rules, we have considered the application of the Altmark criteria, the 2007 passenger transport regulations, and services of general economic interest. The conclusion reached is that it will be necessary to demonstrate full compliance with the four Altmark criteria in order to satisfy the stated rules. The fourth Altmark criteria can be particularly challenging. It can be satisfied by means of a public procurement procedure as highlighted in the European Commission's letter of the 22nd of September. It can also be satisfied by means of a detailed benchmarking exercise to demonstrate that the compensation for discharging the public service obligation does not exceed that which would be required by a typical well-run and adequately equipped undertaking in the ferry sector. It is therefore clear that there are a number of complex legal policy and financial issues which still need to be addressed before we can ascertain whether it would be possible to make a direct award to an in-house operator. However, I am working to address those issues in a positive manner. Uh, we do, for example, need to build a case for making direct awards that satisfy the TECL exemption and stated rules. We have to follow up on the initial views of local communities and stakeholders. 
we have to engage rigorously with the European Commission on the final approach we intend in taking in relation to future procurement of ferry services. It will take time to conduct the necessary analysis, and this has implications for each of the three ferry service contracts. The Clyde and Hebrides ferry services will continue to be operated by CalMac under the terms of the recently tendered contract. That contract will deliver efficiency savings and 350 service improvement commitments. That said, I believe that similar savings and improvements could also be delivered by means of a direct award to an in-house operator. And this will be part of our case for making direct awards that satisfy the requirements of TECL and state aid rules. The current contract effectively guarantees that the Clyde and Hebrides ferry services will be provided by a public sector, sector operator for the best part of the next seven years until the end of September 2024. Now, let me be clear that we cannot and will not put the protection afforded to the Clyde and Hebrides ferry services by the current contract at any risk whatsoever. We need to be sure that a direct award to an in-house operator would meet the full requirements of both the TECL exemption and stated rules before making such an award. However, presiding officer, if I can satisfy the European Commission, which I will work hard to do, it would be my intention to scrap future tendering processes for the Clyde and Hebrides ferry services and appoint the contract to CalMac directly. The current contract provides a sufficient time for further detailed analysis to be given to CalMac's government's arrangements as required by the Tech Hill control test and detailed benchmarking that is required by the fourth Altmark criteria. The conclusion of this analysis will then be used to build the Scottish Government's case for making a direct award to an in-house operator for the Clyde and Hebrides ferry services in the future. In the case of the Northern Isles ferry services, arrangements are in hand to extend the current contract by 18 months from April 2018 to October 2019. A decision on whether it would be possible to make a direct award for the Northern Isles or to continue tendering will have to be taken by the spring of 2018. This timeline will allow 18 months to complete a full tendering procedure, should that be required. In reaching a decision, we will take account of progress made on further consideration of technical exemption and state aid rules. But crucially, we will also follow up on our earlier engagement by writing to key local community stakeholders in order to build a better understanding of their preference for the future approach to procurement of the Northern Isles ferry services. Turning to Gurik Dunun, the current contract was due to have expired in June of this year. That contract was extended by nine months to March 2018, and we will make arrangements to extend it by a further nine months until December 2018. A direct award allowing for the transport of vehicles under the state aid rules is not considered to be a deliverable option, given the limitations of public service obligation, which only applies to the transport of foot passengers. As the Scottish Government's long-standing policy position and the local community's aspiration is for the return of a vehicle carrying service to the town centre route, tendering provides a, an approach that could potentially realise that outcome. For this reason, the currently paused tender exercise will be restarted as soon as practically possible. In setting out the implications for the three ferry service contracts, our priority is to ensure the provision of the best ferry services possible to our islands and remote rural communities, while ensuring value for money to the taxpayer. This priority is supported by our programme for Scotland 2017-18, where we set out our commitment to maximising the socio-economic development of our islands and remote communities through the provision of safe, efficient and reliable ferry services. The interim report published today demonstrates our continued commitment to delivering that outcome. The Minister will now take questions on the issues raised in the statements, uh, for which I'll allow around 20 minutes. So please press your request to speak buttons. Uh, can I have Jamie Green, please? Thank you, Deputy <clears throat> Presiding Officer. And can I thank the Minister for advance sight of his statement. What we have learned today uh, is that despite uh, more than 18 months of intensive wranglings, the government is no further forward in its pursuit of a policy to ditch open and transparent procurement of ferry services in favour of a strategy to directly award contracts to a government-owned entity, which effectively sews up future contracts if given indefinitely to CalMac. Now, clearly, the outmark criteria and technical exemption hoops that have to be jumped through are onerous and causing the government unnecessary headache. In his own words today, they are challenging, to say the least. 
In the context of the following advice from Audit Scotland, which says that Transport Scotland will find it challenging to continue to provide ferry services that meets the needs of users within its allocated budget. All that being said, why is the Minister dogmatically pursuing this ideological decision to avoid future tenders? What are the cost implications to this taxpayer, including the legal costs and government time being spent on engaging with the European Union on its state aid rules? And moreover, given the success of recent tenders, including the Aaron service and the Clyde, does he not agree with me that tender process is a vital one, and a vital one to ensure that incumbent operators are both kept on their toes, but also that it offers the government the opportunity to choose the best operator from a variety of bids which meet the needs of users, but also provides value for money to the taxpayer? Hamza Yusuf. Can I try to... To, to, to be constructive to the member, I thought he was unfair to say that uh, you know we haven't got any further forward. We have. It's our belief, through the detailed work that we've done, that we can make a case for a direct award. Now we have to, of course, satisfy the European Commission. The member will only know clear, clearly from his own party's discussions with the EU that these things can take a bit of time. So we will, of course, uh, approach that uh, in a manner that can be as quick uh, as possible from our perspective. But clearly, we're reliant on the opinion of the European Commission. So there has been work uh, that has been done and the interim report is very detailed and I would welcome uh, some of his feedback on that. You know, he makes, a, this is, he makes a good point that there can be some benefits or perceived benefits of tendering. Uh, that competition helps, uh, you know, those who are bidding to sharpen their pencils to make sure they put in the most efficient bid. Competition uh, can help to drive efficiency. I think that's an argument that he and some of his colleagues have made to me before and it's not one that I, I dismiss what I would say on the other hand, is that it, I believe it is possible to drive those similar efficiencies even with a direct award through KPIs. Uh, and the other point I would make to him is that, of course, tendering can cost. We know the chief's contract, the chief's tender costs around 1.1 million. That's not including the cost that would have uh, emerged uh, from CalMac having to bid, which, of course, is a wholly uh, owned, uh, Scottish government owned uh, company. In terms of, you mentioned Aaron, I think he would do well to speak to the community on Aaron to take their views on whether they would prefer uh, CalMac to have this uh, contract directly awarded or whether they would like uh, competitive uh, tender in the future. Uh, but our ferry services uh, are run well. And on the final point that he made in relation to the Audit Scotland report, in fact, the Audit Scotland report itself, its opening line, of course, was that the ferry services in Scotland are run well. Neil Bibby. Thank the Minister for advance copy of his statement. There will inevitably be some frustration that a decision on TECO exemption uh, has been delayed. However, I can say this gives us the opportunity to get it uh, right. I would ask that the Minister builds a case with island communities, trade unions and members from across the Chamber for ending the costly tendering process. Can I ask the Minister how many times he has met the European Commission to discuss the Ultima 4 criteria and state aid guidelines? The Minister will also be aware that specification changes can be made to the Northern Isles service irrespective of TECO. Will the Minister agree to an expanded contract to include inter-island services and an increased freight capacity? Two weeks ago, this Parliament called on the Scottish Government to agree fair funding for inter-island ferry services in the Northern Isles. What steps has the Government since taken to ensure investment in the fleet does not put those councils at a disproportionate financial risk? Finally, since the Minister's last statement, Audit Scotland has published their report on ferry services. They found that there is no Scotland-wide long-term strategy for ferries, and they said that it would be challenging to continue to provide ferry services that meets the needs of users within allocated budgets. So in light of his statement today, how will the Minister address the concerns raised by Audit Scotland? This should be the last question, Mr Bibby. that publicly owned ferry services can be run effectively, affordably and in the public interest? Hamza Yousaf. I thank the member uh, for his questions. Um, yes, I will engage, of course, with the unions and with uh, any other stakeholders in relation to, to building uh, a case. Uh, I've met with them on a number of occasions, uh, most recently on this issue, uh, just a couple of, of weeks ago. Uh, my officials have met with the European Commission on a number of occasions and meet, meet with them uh, regularly to discuss the TECL exemption. It's how we've managed to get to the position uh, that we've got to. I thought he strayed slightly off topic uh, I'm sure accidentally onto inter-island uh, ferry services. And I would repeat what I said in the chamber only a few moments ago, which is that, uh, of course, there is a window of opportunity for his own party to set on record whether or not they would support a final budget in February, 
if it included provision for inter-island ferries. He, I asked his colleague Rhoda Grant that question. She, of course, refused to say that she would. Um, so he does have that opportunity. Or indeed, any of his colleagues uh, who are going to ask questions next uh, can, of course, clarify that point. In terms of the Audit Scotland report, what I would say is I thought the recommendations uh, were very positive. They're ones that we reflect on. We do, of course, have a ferries plan uh, up until 2022. The call from Audit Scotland was to have a longer term ferry plan. I think that's a very eminently sensible recommendation from Audit Scotland. And as I say, it's one that we'll reflect on. Again, I'm probably oversubscribed in questions, so uh, please be succinct. Kenneth Gibson, followed by Maurice Corey. Th thank you, Presiding Officer. As a constituency MSP for the Island of Arna, I can say that certainty is very important to islanders in terms of uh, service delivery, and therefore I believe that they will uh, welcome uh, the Minister's comments today. I'm just wondering about the, the, the issue of governance arrangements, which uh, the Minister talked about in his statement. Uh, I'm just wondering if he can uh, perhaps uh, talk about what uh, changes to governance would have to be made by David McBrain should uh, the Minister's plans come to fruition. Hamza Yusuf. In the, in the interest of brevity, I'm hoping it can be minimal changes because we certainly don't uh, envisage that the changes we will make will have any or indeed only little impact on employees. It really refers to what you call the technical tests and, and the control test. And I'll just uh, read uh, part A of that uh, directly and it says, the contracting authority exercises over that person uh, control similar to that which it exercises over its own departments. That's called the control test. So essentially, uh, we would have to ensure that David McBrain's uh, governance was aligned in similar ways to our own government departments. Transport Scotland, perhaps, would be uh, an example uh, of that. So we're working through the detail of that, what it will mean. Of course, we'll work closely with CalMac. But the minimal change would be better because I believe that the relationship we have with CalMac uh, works well on an operational level. Maurice Corey, followed by Jackie Bailey. Thank you, Deputy Signing Officer. I'm pleased to learn from the Minister that the Gurek to Danoon ferry tender process has restarted. Can the Minister this afternoon confirm to this Chamber that the timelines, process and any job losses in this tender uh, are affected and also update us on the Gurek to Kilcreggan ferry tender process itself? Hamza Yusuf. Well, on his Gurek uh, to Kilcreggan, I couldn't uh, update him because, of course, he knows that that is the responsibility of SPT, not this uh, government. However, uh, I will look, I'm sure, shortly to get uh, an update uh, before the, the holidays uh, from Councillor Martin Bortos, the chair uh, of SPT. Uh, in relation to his other question, we don't envisage uh, job losses as a result of this tendering process. As I say, there is an extension, a further nine-month extension uh, to the contract at Gurek Danoon. It is uh, the only way that I can see, potentially, a vehicle uh, service uh, could come into fruition. Jackie Bailey, followed by John Finney. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Minister has, of course, previously said that the transfer of the Gorek to Kilcreggan ferry service from SPT to the Scottish Government had to await the outcome of the procurement policy review. And local passengers, and indeed members of this chamber, have been very patient. Now that he's decided to tender the Gorek to Danoon route, will he take steps to transfer the Gorek to Kilcreggan service, as promised, to the Scottish Government and provide me with an indication of the likely timetable? Again, Hamza, I'm not entirely convinced it's related to the statement, but of course I'll give uh, the member uh, an update. What I would say is the promise has always been to have constructive dialogue in order to explore the fair funding formula for the transfer. Now, we'll continue, of course, to do that. The member will be aware that recently that service was retendered. A number of bidders, of course, have come forward, and therefore we're hopefully able to establish, once a bidder, of course, has chosen, what the true cost of that contract will be. That helps to inform our discussions, and I can give the member an absolute assurance that those conversations will continue in the very constructive way that they have with SPT thus far. Can I remind members that it's about issues raised in the statement, though I can see it's been very imaginative hooks going on here. <laughs> so can I call John Finney, followed by Stuart McMillan. Uh, thank you, President Officer. I, I thank the Minister for early sight of the, the statement and, and commend the good work that has been going on, hopefully much more to come. Uh, Minister, community views are very important, but they're only one factor in decision-making. And the problem with a commercial supplier is that they'll always weigh up, particularly a multinational one, it's all the way up cost and profits, so the situation can change. Um, I think... A, previous contributor talked about political philosophy. This is about a political philosophy. You either support 
um, Mr. Finnegan, if a question, in the public, please. Yes, exclusively in the public interest or not. Can you explain what weighting you put on um, the, the public's views? And would you accept that they can change? Hamza Youssef. I do accept that they can change, but what I would say in terms of political philosophy, I've been very consistent since my statement in February that this government's preference is for a direct award across the country. What I would say, though, equally as a political philosophy of ours is that we should be listening to the communities, uh, of course, themselves. So if the communities are hostile to a direct award, if a community wishes to see a tendering for whatever reason, then I don't think we can discount that. And I would say I would put uh, a lot of weight uh, to that, but uh, that is not the only factor uh, that should be considered by any, any matter or, or means. And what I will be engaging with in the new year, uh, and my officials will be engaging with, is the process of community engagement. And of course, I'll keep the member updated on how that goes. Stuart McMillan, followed by Tavish Scott. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can the Minister be more specific in terms of the timescale uh, for the restarting of the Gurukh Danun uh, tender exercise? And also, uh, what does he hope to achieve with that process? Hamza Yusuf. Effectively, it will start as soon as practically possible. Obviously, when we pause a uh, tender, uh, there's a number of things we'll have to do to restart it. But early in the new year would be absolutely the intention uh, to restart it. The extension that we've asked for uh, is it takes us up to December 2018. Therefore, obviously, a new ferry contract would have to be in place by then. But I can keep the member updated on the progress uh, of, of the, uh, the tender exercise. Tavish Scott, followed by John Mason. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Would the Minister accept that uh, people in the Northern Isles, uh, Ogden and Shetland, will be today disappointed that he hasn't announced the retendering of the North Isles services, because that's very much what uh, they wish to see, and that was reflected, indeed, in his own uh, document that has been published uh, today. Would he accept that if he decides to take this in-house, uh, we will see a freight operation set up in competition with that, because that's what happened 15 years ago, and I don't think that's in the interests of either the government or, indeed, the islands. And therefore, would he undertake to get on with that retendering of the Northern Isles, which is very much what's looked for, and also publish the freight fares review because that's also a document that is badly needed not just in the Northern Isles but indeed in the West Coast as well. Hamza Yusuf. Can I say I actually find that a very helpful contribution from uh, Tavish uh, Scott. I don't mean to sound surprised when I said that but generally helpful uh, contribution from, from Tavish Scott there that on well, the freight fares review we obviously didn't commit to a timing uh, of when to, to publish that but I accept his point wholeheartedly that uh, whenever I travel to the islands this is an issue that is uh, raising uh, much concern, so therefore uh, I, I accept what he says and I can give him an assurance that we are working to get to a solution where, of course, uh, we see the benefits uh, of, of a review and policy, uh, and I don't think we've got to that position yet, so I will continue to keep him updated. On his more substantial point, um, I found it interesting and helpful because it's probably the first time I've had an indication uh, from the constituency member that uh, they would be opposed to a direct award, if that is what I heard uh, correctly. Uh, in my travels to Shetland and Orkney, I have to say, at best, it seems the community agnostic, uh, some very openly hostile uh, to that. So, uh, of course, his view on this will be important to me, as will the MP's view, uh, as will, of course, the council's view, as well as ferry groups and local communities. But uh, he can get assurance that the extension of the contract uh, will, in some essence, of course, give reassurance to local community in Shetland that they will have stability uh, for, for, for the 18 months that we've extended the contract. John Mason, followed by Jamie Halcrow Johnson. Thank you. Uh, I mean, I very much welcome the fact that the Minister is proceeding carefully in all of this. Could he spell out for us what the risks are if he was to rush this process and make an in house award? Hamza Youssef. Well, I know John Mason was an accountant in a former life, so I'm pleased that uh, he's continuing that prudent uh, approach. And he's right, we have to be uh, careful uh, <laughs> in terms of the approach that we take, because if we simply directly awarded a contract without satisfying the state aid rules, without satisfying uh, the TECL uh, criteria, then of course there would be uh, a real uh, potential that it would be challenged to the European uh, Commission and therefore we'd have to retender, which would be a costly exercise in itself. So we do have to make sure that we fulfil uh, the various criteria, whether that's state aid or whether that's TECL. I'm of the opinion that we can do that. Uh, that will be the approach the government will be taking. And as I say, if we can satisfy, uh, certainly for Clyde and Hebrides, it would absolutely be my intention uh, to scrap any future uh, tenders. Jamie Halcrow Johnson, followed by Angus MacDonald. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can, I, uh, can the Minister update us on the outcomes of discussions with Circo Northlink on the extension of the uh, Northern Isles Ferries uh, contract to October 2019? And also, is he able to give assurances that the extension to the contract will not have any adverse impact on the current service? Hamza Youssef. I can absolutely give that assurance. I have to say, I have a very good working relationship with Stuart Garrett. 
uh, who he'll know well, uh, who's based at uh, Circle Northlink. He's been very helpful, very constructive uh, from day one on their approach, uh, and I commend him and give him credit uh, for that. So there will be stability for the Northern Isles for the service that they receive, uh, and there should be no detriment at all uh, in service for the period of that contract extension. Angus MacDonald, followed by David Stewart. Presiding officer, I should refer members to my register of interest. I own a non-domestic property in the, the Western Isles. Um, personally, I, I do hope we see uh, the scrapping of future tendering processes for Clyde and Hebrides Ferry Services with CalMac appointed indefinitely, and I'm sure that the majority of customers uh, share that hope. Um, th does the Minister agree that the priority of this whole process is to guarantee the best ferry services possible and also to ensure value for money for taxpayers? Hamza Youssef. Well, I think that's absolutely right. And it takes me back to, to my answer to Jamie Green's question that, um, you know, we have to ensure that if we get to a position where a direct award is possible, uh, is legally compatible, then we have to ensure that the appropriate KPIs are put in place uh, so that uh, efficiency uh, is, is driven throughout the contract and best value for the taxpayer and, and for the consumer. And it's worth saying that, of course, uh, there has been a huge increase in ferry traffic and tourism to our islands, no doubt driven by our decision to roll out uh, RET in the Western Isles. And I hope to see a similar boom in tourism as we look to roll out RET in the Northern Isles, a manifesto commitment we've met, uh, which will be rolled out in the first half of 2018. David Stewart, followed by Marie Gouchon. Thank you, President Officer. The Minister refers to the challenging nature of the fourth uh, Altmark criterion, but as Thompson solicitors have made clear, this criterion has been successfully met in the past in case L189 oblique 3 on the Italian Postal Service. Could the Minister ask his officials to check this case as it may help in discussions around the Northern Isles and the Guruk to Dunoon ferry service? Hamza, you said. I will, but I know they've checked it and I know I've also looked at the case and I know it's one that's been raised by David Stewart himself and also been raised by the RMT as well. Uh, and I thank uh, David Stewart, I should say, uh, very much on the record to and always been a driving force uh, around this issue of the TechL exemption, uh, along with uh, colleagues in the RNT. What I would say to David Stewart is it's also my belief that we can satisfy both the state aid criteria and the TechL exemption uh, tests as well. Now I've clearly got to make that case to the European Commission, and it is for the European Commission to determine whether or not we have satisfied those. But uh, I know the case he's talking about, uh, and of course I will give it uh, further reflection. The last question in this statement is Mary Goujon. Can the Minister confirm that any decision to be taken will not delay arrangements for the introduction of cheaper fares on the Northern Isles, Isles service? Hamza Youssef. Yes. <laughs> well, you've all surpassed yourselves this afternoon. I have to say we've run out of questions. <laughs> so that concludes questions on the Ferry Services Procurement Policy Review. And we shall move on to the next item of business, give you a couple of minutes to shift seats around.